Hi, I'm Joanna Lee. Um, my co-panelists and I are uh, here to give you some pointers on how to successfully evangelize uh, greater open source engagement in your company. Um, I'm Joanna Lee. I'm a partner and attorney at the law firm of Gesmer up to Grove. Um, I work with open source foundations, including Linux Foundation and uh, ONF, uh, as well as standard setting organizations. Um, and I also work with tech companies in various stages and sizes of growth, from uh, small technology startups uh, to large Fortune 100 companies. Um, and uh, many of them are engaged in open source in various capacities and stages. Uh, so uh, I've observed that there are stages of open source engagement, um, everything ranging from no engagement at all, where a company uh, might have no policy whatsoever uh, on the use or contribution to open source, uh, or there might even be an uh, explicit prohibition on the use or contribution to open source. And then at the opposite end, um, we have strategic influencers, which are companies that uh, contribute to open source and, are, and use their leadership uh, in communities to really help shape and influence uh, ecosystems. Uh, a lot of companies are in between these two uh, ends of the spectrum. Uh, some just consume open source, so they're very consumption focused, um, and they don't contribute. Uh, some contribute um, at a small scale, and some uh, participate in community leadership and help grow communities. Um, we're going to focus today on evangelizing, advancing from consumer to contributor, and from contributor to community leader. So evangelizing, moving from one stage to the next in your company, um, it, it takes time. Uh, you need to get all the stakeholders uh, aligned uh, and, and get buy-in from all of them, and that includes the business and strategy folks, product, technology, legal, cybersecurity, and risk management. Um, it, it usually takes a dedicated champion or a team of champions, um, and it takes a lot of time in meetings. Um, and uh, here's a, a chart of the levels of buy-in, which you, some of you might be aware of. Um, you need to get everybody, uh, in order to get to the next stage, you need to get uh, at least everyone above that red line to compliance. Um, but ideally, um, you might even get them to uh, an, a level of enthusiasm. I'm going to turn this over to my co-panelist, uh, Eddie. Thanks. So I've had the uh, pleasure of working with a whole bunch of uh, clients over the years going exactly in this direction. Um, some of them more successfully than others, most of them involved uh, a whole lot of these meetings that we talk about. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of ways that you get these people to actually start moving in the right direction. Uh, one of them is a specific business driver. Um, client I had the opportunity to work with last year was really trying to figure a way to stop paying a really big IT vendor a whole lot of money to do a lot of work for them and to get rid of a lot of their legacy software that they were paying renewals on and didn't really know what it did. And that was literally what drove the conversation to start talking about can we adopt open. Um, and set in a meeting with a number of folks from legal, from risk, uh, from even the CIO's office who said, Oh yeah, since we don't do any open source now, this is gonna be all new for us. And the joke was, I literally pulled up their webpage right then, did the developer view source and showed them the HTTPD Apache web server that was running their website publicly facing. I said, so you kind of do use open source, you just don't know you use open source. So, you know, take that off the table first, let's get that we don't do it here off the table and then move forward from there. Luckily, the CIO was more engaged and realized that they were using open source, but there were people on his team who literally said, oh, we don't have any open source today anywhere in the company. So you, you gotta get past some of those, and then really talking about what are we going to accomplish with this, right? So a multi-billion dollar company I worked with two years ago, and they came in with a we use, we don't ever give back, so they're really in the consume only view of the world. We'll use everything, but no one here can ever contribute back anything because it could be RIP. And they had more, more people in their risk organization than they had in their IT organization within a multi-billion dollar company. And no joke, there was an extra zero on the number of people in risk that there were in IT. So they were doing it exactly wrong. Um, but 
on top of that, the conversations turned into, you know, what, what are we going to do? How are we possibly going to get from where we are to there? We, you know, we, we've never allowed any of this. We always just use it. it. We know it's implemented everywhere, but how can we get there? And the conversation turned into, well, we have to get there. So now that we know we have to get there, we have to find a way to get there. And luckily, some people kind of jumped on the bandwagon. We had some real discussions and we went through some actual examples of open source licenses. We pulled up the Apache license, we pulled up an MIT license and talked about the differences. And then somebody, of course, brought up the GNU and that always causes trouble. Um, and then a few others. And we went through like, what does this mean to you? And what do you have to do if you're already consuming this stuff and developing against it? you're actually already violating this license because you're not giving back what you built on top of this and you have to by the license you accepted by using this. And they, oh, well, we didn't know that, right? So that got up some of the kind of things out of the way really quickly um, and that helps a lot. Um, another thing is if you can demonstrate how giving something back can help you. Um, you know, we, we were working with a financial services company uh, and they said, well, you know, everything we build in this environment is all RIP and everything is protected and only us, we're the only ones who know how to use this and we're the only ones who could possibly benefit from it. And then we went to GitHub and did a search on a few things they were building and showed them multiple projects that were sitting out there that had been contributed by competitors in their industry that were literally doing what they were doing. like very similar implementations almost to the code level. And like, chances are the guy who wrote this went to this GitHub repo and he didn't copy the code because he was it was written in a different language. He was very careful not to just take the code, but he probably read this Git repo and figured out how to do this and then went over here and implemented it in Go because you guys built your stuff in Go and that was in Python, so it's very different. But it, chances are he probably built this entire thing off of a Git repo that had been out there for like five years. So, you know, nice try. Um, but those, those kind of conversations, again, help move things along very, very quickly. Um, the, another one that we're working on now is a company who not only uses but contributes back a whole lot of things to open source, but they're not allowed to officially do it with their identification of the company they work for. Like, why in the hell would you do that? Like, my question was, like, what could the company benefit from by making sure they don't use their public Git name having anything to do with the company they work for. You're getting none of the cred for giving this stuff back. And we had a, another heated conversation about how well it put the company at risk and there could be liability. And we went through an example of companies that had way more revenue than them and way more to risk than them that were contributing things back openly. We pulled up a couple of the um, Apache projects because uh, like Cassandra is one of the ones I worked on early on. So we pulled up Apache Cassandra. I'm like, okay, so the committers on this list are Apple, Netflix, you know, and go down the list, right? So you don't have as much to risk as they do, I promise. So maybe we look at this differently and decide that it may actually help you. And it turns out they're actually doing a much better job of recruiting now into their developer group because they're publicly saying now that they're contributing back. And to be fair, Apple was always incredibly against any of that. And they figured out that they could not move some of the balls forward that they wanted to move forward in the things they were doing without getting some people that actually wanted to work there. And they stole, like in their Cassandra group, they've got, what, a guy from Netflix that they took. They got a guy out of Facebook. I can't remember where the other one is, but they now have, I think, five committers for Apache Cassandra sitting at Apple, working for Apple, who openly talk about contributing. So. Anyway, I'll stop because I could go on with stories for days, but catch me later if you want to talk and I will hand it off. Quick show of hands. Uh, how many people think of themselves as engineers here? Okay, and business people? And finally, lawyers. That's uh, a front row. Okay, so I'll avoid the front row. Um, so I've just got two slides. Uh, my name's Steve Wally. I presently work in the Microsoft Azure team in the office of the C uh, CTO. Um, I joke, I used to work for Microsoft, and I joked that my job was explaining open source to executives to get us to do more. And now 15 years later, I'm explaining open source to executives to possibly get us to do less. Um, 
but I've been doing this kind of work for a very long time since before we called it open source. And to me, it's all about engineering collaboration. And so I'd, my two slides are kind of what I could boil 30 years of kind of doing this in product down to. Um, you're either a consumer or you're a producer. And when I say you're a producer, I'm talking about you're creating your own projects. Um, you, and we'll talk about foundations in a minute. So I'm not talking about you're contributing to somebody else. Uh, consumer, so Red Hat is a consumer. They consume the Linux kernel kind of thing. Um, and it really is all about the engineering economics. Uh, this, we, we have collaborated on software since we've written it all the way back to 1950. I can literally bore you with stories that go back to Princeton and the first programmable computer in America kind of thing. Um, what you're looking for is orders of magnitude of value capture. A uh, company I did back in the 90s, again, before we called it open source, uh, I needed control of my compiler world, so we started using GCC. I could have pivoted my development team to go and write a compiler, but that wouldn't have been a good use of time. Um, so we captured about $10 million of value in 1997 dollars for about $100,000 worth of engineering expense. And then when we took all of our changes back upstream, so not just published them according to the GPL, but actually worked to get them back upstream, I'm now in a consumption vector where I'm looking at about $10,000 of engineering uh, expense every time I up, you know, up level the compiler. So that's what you're looking to do. And that's why you don't want to sit on forks. Forks are brittle and expensive. Um, if you're on the producing side, this is the, the hardest mistake that I see everybody make, uh, with the exception of Red Hat, probably. Don't confuse your projects and your products. These are different concepts with different groups. Uh, community members, they have time. They don't have money. They can't buy anything from you. Customers, they have time. Uh, sorry, money, but they don't have time. Those are the people you want to focus your products on. And these are different discussions you're going to have with folks. Um, Freeloaders, when you're building that community, freeloaders means you're doing it right. And this is just how communities in society work. You know, if I asked everybody in this room, how many of you, you know, you all live in your neighborhood for very personal reasons. But if I asked how many people can actually report a street lamp out on their street or a pothole in the road, I'm betting we'd be down to about 10% of you. And then if I said, and who order, organizes the block party? For the number of people in here, I'm betting we get one hand up. That's how communities work. That's how you know, society works. And the way, you know, I tripped over this 20 years ago, and the statement that was made out loud was, yeah, you know, for every 1,000 users we have, we get about 100 bug reports, of which 10 people give us a patch of what one read our contribution guidelines. That's the, that's the kind of thing you're playing with here. So freeloaders means you're doing it right. And that means you have to actually build the on-ramps for all of those users to find the developers to encourage the contributors. Because those developers, they didn't come to work on your stuff. They actually came to solve their own problem. That's the basics. Let's talk about your advanced game now. Strategy and foundations. Um, this really is about strategy. Uh, working for Microsoft, uh, I go around giving something called the culture talk. People want to understand why Microsoft's different today. And what I have to convince people is open source is not a strategy for Microsoft. Um, it's often phrased in the question, you know, uh, what happens if Nadella leaves? Does the strategy change? Uh, the way that's sometimes fearfully asked is what happens if Balmer comes back? Um, so, you know, that's the world I live in right now. But this really is, it's a cultural shift at Microsoft for how we do things, and it actually fits the original ethos of the company if you go all the way back into the 80s and 90s. Um, you know, strategy really is the budget decisions you, you're making. It's not about what you claim about open source, it's what you're gonna do with open source, whether you're producing projects of your own or whether you're consuming it for those orders of magnitude of value capture. But you gotta know the, you know, the objectives uh, this is very much what you know, Eddie was saying, that you have to understand why you're going to do this. I still get involved in conversations at Microsoft that it's like you go into the room and it's, we're doing open source. And you think, okay, so what are you doing? Well, open source. And it's like, why? Well, because 
Nadella said, it's good. <laughs> and it's like, no, we need a little more business objective here as to what we're trying to do. Are we trying to save money? Are we trying to influence a marketplace? Are we building a complement that goes well with one of our product revenue streams? You know, you have to have that objective there. Um, you need to think beyond your intellectual property strategy into an intellectual asset strategy. Um, though that sentence doesn't really mean anything to the lawyers, but I'm trying to convince folks on the engineering side. Instead of taking every piece of software that you have and thinking about it as we have to patent this or we have to you know, copyright and lock it away, is what other advantage might you get that complements the rest of the business strategy by sharing it? That's just a very different way of thinking about the issue in front of you. Um, there is this idea of foundations, and you step over that into that space. Um, the last bullet's probably the most important one that you care about. The thing you have to remember about all of these foundations, if they're uh, a, a member organization rather than something for the public good, is this is a place that um, competitors can collaborate with a tripping antitrust law. So that's the first thing you have to you know, be comfortable with when you start having that kind of a discussion. And once you're there, then you can start to figure out, okay, are we doing something as an industry with partners together? And the room's gonna be messy, it just is. I, I, everybody in this room is probably well familiar with the mess that is standards and how you arrive at consensus that way. Um, Everything Scott was saying is excruciatingly important. Standards are very different beasts from open source, even though it both, in both cases it looks like a room full of engineers collaborating. Um, they're very different tools. And so you can, you can do some really interesting things in the open source space this way. Um, you, but understand again that you've got different tools there. If you look at something like the Apache Software Foundation, that is very focused on project health and how to make a successful community. You know, community over code is their tagline. Whereas if you look at something like the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, um, if you talk to them, they'll tell you that they're going after an ecosystem. They're trying to build a, a rich ecosystem of partners in that space. So again, very different things, both hiding under the name of foundation. And that's all I'm gonna say right now. I'm gonna turn it back over. So we're gonna zoom in a bit on the point here about thinking beyond your intellectual property strategy to your intellectual asset strategy. Um, so at the various phases of uh, open source engagement, there are slightly different legal concerns that tend to be dominant. Um, in the later uh, stages, intellectual property protection is almost always uh, legal's primary concern. Uh, when you go to them and ask them, um, hey, I want to contribute to this open source, they usually uh, want to know how, how are we going to protect our IP if, if you want to give it away. Um, so there is one question, the, the global question, the million dollar question is, um, is it more strategically beneficial to exclusively control this asset or to share it and why? Um, it's really important that you can clearly articulate the answer uh, to this question uh, in order to get buy-in from legal. And, uh, and asking this on an asset by asset basis or, or based in categories of assets. Um, and this may seem like a very self-evident inquiry to those people in this room, um, but for uh, depending on what type of legal culture your company has. So if you're fortunate enough to have lawyers at your company like the lawyers that were on the last panel, um, they're very sophisticated about open source, about IP strategy. Um, they're already taking a very nuanced approach to how they develop strategy and intellectual property protection strategy. Um, however, if you're at a company with a more conservative legal culture and lawyers who have never, who haven't really done much work in open source, um, they may believe that the purpose of their existence is to lock everything down. So if it's patentable, patent it. If it's copyrightable, copyright it. Um, they may have never engaged in an inquiry be before about strategy of sharing. They're only thinking about sharing a uh, strategy of exclusive control. So this, is, this could be a paradigm shift. Um, so if you're at one of those companies with a more conservative legal culture, um, you're going to have to lead the discussion about is it more strategically beneficial to control this or to share it? 
so uh, here are some factors uh, and questions uh, to consider as you're having those internal discussions. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it's some of, these are some of the questions that your legal team is really going to, get to care uh, about uh, your answering. Um, so uh, what role does this asset play in helping to generate revenue? Is itself uh, a revenue generator? Like, do you charge royalties for this uh, asset? Or is it complementary to products and services that do generate revenue? Uh, so uh, then that will, that, will that will greatly impact uh, whether or not you want to control or, or possibly share it. Um, also, does this asset support a shared ecosystem that enhances demand for the products and services that do generate revenue? Um, for example, through interoperability. We're at a telecom conference, so um, almost all of uh, your company's meaningful uh, intellectual assets play some role in an interoperable ecosystem, and the question is, what is that role? Um, and is that, such a, is that a role that, um, uh, is, is that a role such that sharing the asset um, or, or, or influencing interoperability using it or, or locking it down is the most strategically beneficial course of action? Also, is this asset a key competitive differentiator? Um, if it's not, um, or if it's very easy to design around it or indeed dependently develop uh, a substitute and alternative, um, it's like some of the uh, use cases that Eddie was discussing, um, protecting it with patents and trade secrets and copyrights isn't really all that valuable because it only gives you an illusion of exclusive control, not actual exclusive control. Um, also, can this asset be used to create meaningful barriers to entry? And are these barriers to entry that you want? Um, and don't assume that proprietary ownership is the only way to use an asset to create uh, barriers to entry. Another question, if, ex if exclusive control is even possible, um, after answering all the questions above, um, is there a way to strategically exercise that exclusive control? And then you compare and contrast that with some of the, the potential benefits um, of, of sharing this asset. Um, and, and sometimes after going through this inquiry, it's quite clear, does it make sense to contribute or control this asset? But sometimes it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, I'm gonna walk through a few examples so you understand how um, this inquiry uh, plays out in, in real life. Uh, so one example is the Android operating system. Uh, this is a shared asset, uh, it's open source. Uh, Google, the way they make money from this is they make money from Google Ads and they make money from commissions on sales of apps in the uh, Google Play App Store. Um, so Android is a much more valuable asset to Google as a shared community asset than, a, than it would be as a closed proprietary asset. Notice, note that the ecosystem itself that they've created, um, its size, the network effects, its openness, um, some of the technical advantages, um, that is a competitive differentiator. Um, it's also an example of how an open ecosystem, which is open in many ways, um, can be leveraged to create barriers uh, to entry for the products that do generate uh, revenue. Another example is Microsoft Azure. Um, so Microsoft contributes to Linux and uh, many other open source projects that run on Azure Cloud. Um, and Linux usage uh, on Microsoft Azure has already surpassed Windows usage. Um, and I'd like to invite my um, co-panelists uh, to say a few words about the strategic benefits of sharing. I was worried for a moment. I forgot about this part. Um, so this is something that Microsoft's been doing more and more of. And understand that you know, we're selling cycles. That, so this, this growth of Windows started as very much the, win, uh, sorry, Azure started as the Windows Cloud. But there was this sudden horrifying recognition about five, six years ago that Linux had to be a first party operating system. Now we were already contributing to the Linux kernel. We've been contributing to the Linux kernel for almost a decade now. But there was this realization that our growth is dependent on making Linux a first party operating system on Azure. And so there's been this drive towards doing more and more in the open source community. Uh, same thing can be said for, I mean, we offer up various different uh, databases, but even our participation in the Kubernetes world is the same kind of thing. Uh, Azure Kubernetes service, that is a product 
that we are you know, selling that service, but it's based on the Kubernetes project that we've spent a lot of time and effort becoming expert at in, in that very rich ecosystem. Another example uh, is Puppet, an IT automation software company. Uh, their business model has um, a lot of similarities with Red Hat's. Um, they release uh, much of their code as open source um, to leverage a broader community to help evolve its software. And they generate revenue um, by selling supported enterprise versions, uh, which do include a few proprietary features. Um, and part of the reason I included Puppet as an example is um, when, when you're doing this inquiry on an uh, asset by asset basis, you can get very granular in defining what an asset is. So a single program could have certain lines of code um, associated with proprietary features that are maintained as proprietary, um, and uh, many lines of code that are uh, instead uh, shared as a community resource. So there are some additional considerations related to patents. Um, so if you're going to have a conversation with legal about contributing to open source, um, it's helpful to understand um, does your company have software patents, and if they do, um, how do they intend to use those software patents? So if they're using software patents uh, primarily defensively, um, it's not going to be uh, as difficult uh, to get over that hur hurdle in, term in, in terms of getting buy-in to contribute to open source. Um, in fact, uh, there have been uh, cases in which open source license enforcement has been used as a defensive tactic in uh, patent lawsuits. Uh, however, if your company intends to use um, software patents offensively or to generate licensing revenue, uh, the IP uh, analysis is going to be more, more complex. Not insurmountable, but more complex. And there's going to be a lot of discussions about the precise licensing terms, um, the scope of the project, how that's going to evolve, um, and you're going to have to get very, very granular about what it is you want to contribute and why. Uh, so there are many uh, benefits to contributing to open source. Uh, a lot of them have been discussed by my co-panelists, so I'm not going to repeat them all here. Um, I'll leave you with uh, one of my favorite quotes, though, which is, uh, if you don't contribute to the projects that you use, you're a passenger on a plane with someone else setting the destination. And uh, are there any questions? Good, thank you. Any questions? Yeah. So I think just uh, one observation on my part, and then um, you know, then an applause or an order. It's that um, well, two things. I think you know, I uh, the the nuance of open source licensing um, is uh, is not trivial, and but uh, you know, it's important for people to realize that I think in uh, in the ONF's case, you know, um, we have things in a pretty clean st uh, state. Things are all Apache 2.0 licensed, and so. Um, those consuming from the project um, are, uh, you know, in pretty good shape, um, generally speaking. Um, uh, the, you know, there is a nuance in the in the ONF space where we do have uh, IPR that applies to st um, standardization specification work that we do. You know, uh, it does not apply to open source. That was mentioned today. Um, but if anybody is touching in on that work and they need help understanding how to navigate that, uh, you know, we're here to, and happy to help. Um, that generally does not uh, have implications for those using the open source. Uh, and then lastly, you know, Joanna, there's one thing you touched in on, which was that um, you know, one of um, the motivations for contributing to open source and, and participating in open source in our community is really that the customers, the consumers, are demanding that they are um, working with vendors that are working in, um, in an open source environment, which is different than a number of the uh, examples and use cases that were described, which, um, which is an interesting dynamic in, in the room here, in the conference here, and in the work that ONF does. And I thought that would be interesting for, for you and to try to help you know, connect the dots. A lot of vendors are, um, are uh, you know, finding that they need to walk a line. They want to be involved with or respond to an RFP or, or, or to a project, but the operators are saying or demanding um, the, the use of open source, and that's then um, really forcing the vendors to have to try to find a way to navigate and figure out um, and start to then um, look at and answer and address these kinds of questions. You know, so it's, um, uh, you did touch it in one bullet, but that's a very um, that really captures a lot of what's going on here. You know, so I guess not so much a question, but some commentary. Sure. So. Thanks. A question? Yeah. It's not 
really a question. Well, maybe it's just for my education. So um, I, I work for OCP. And uh, we have something called an OWF CLA, which is an Open Web Foundation Contribution License Agreement. And that's basically, from what I understand, and Michael can probably correct me, but it's a copyright grant and it's a patent grant for a non-assert um, for the contribution that you're making. And it's very specific to a specification um, that is included in under the CLA uh, or under their final spec agreement. Um, so that covers the hardware specification, and in some cases your FRAN license or your RAN license covers the hardware specification. Then you have your GitHub that is covered a, under an OSI license of some sort, Apache, BSDL, MIT, GPL, it, you name it, right? Um, and that is specifically towards a binary code or code that people are going to use, download, do something with, right, and build upon. Then there's this weird category, which is, could be an architectural document, it could be how you put the code together for the microarchitecture of the code plus some hardware spec. Um, what kind of license would really cover that? Because it's not really technically a hardware spec. It's not technically code that one would use. It's just how to use the code. It's an implementation of the code that has some IP associated with it because, you know, a, a contributor may be putting it together a certain way and they, they feel like that's their IP. So I guess that's a question for the lawyers in the group and, and the, you know, maybe you <laughs> from a... Do you think that that's, am I imagining something that looks like kind of like a user guide um, or... It could be a user guide, it could just be an API kind of environment where it's not really the code that is being contributed, but it's a description of the API and how it's being implemented. Yeah, yeah. It could be a microarchitecture document. It's it's a document, but there is IP behind it. At least that's my understanding that there is IP behind it because it's being put together in a certain way. Yeah. So you could. So the the people who are are monitoring that work and kind of shepherding it and trying to. Um, uh, make sure that it gets adopted and used by mm -hmm. a community are going to want to make sure that it has open enough licensing terms to make the users feel comfortable that there's nothing they need to worry about. So you can use different kinds of copyright licenses mm -hmm. um, or uh, something that pops to my mind like a, a very open and permissive license. Right. I mean, if it's a if it's a written written material like a guide or a, a document, mm -hmm. it's going to have some copyrightable elements in it, probably, and it, you can use um, various permissive and open licenses. Maybe even something like a Creative Commons license, if mm -hmm. that if if that appeals and it meets all the needs of the community. Okay. There's a couple of different uh, there, way, ways be, you could do. Would there be a contribution license agreement associated with it because there is IP, or would it just be a copyright because they're actually physically sharing? And maybe, you know, you can help me understand that. CLA. Yeah. yeah, that's a CLA versus no CLA issue, which. Um, Let's chat about that offline, because okay. <laughs> that's uh, that's a whole can of worms that's yeah, well, outside the scope of this. We're this kind presentation. of you know we're faced with that. Is is it really IP or is it not? And how do we how do we make sure that whoever's using it, downloading it, mm -hmm. is not going to get a patent asserted because it's open, <laughs> at least on, under our purview. So mm -hmm. take that offline. But I was just kind of curious about that. Those in between documents. Good, thank you. So um, if there are no further questions, yeah? Okay, wait a second. Sorry, I think today we will have a really good opportunity to have um, uh, some um, education from you. Uh, and uh, I worked in some uh, uh, SDO uh, to uh, participate in some uh, standard uh, uh, definition, and uh, I also worked in uh, own life uh, and participate in some uh, open source uh, uh, work. And uh, my question is that, uh, you know, uh, for the standard such as uh, in IETF, the standard, uh, uh, maybe uh, an RFC, it's very short. And the scope is very limited. So when the 
IFC or the working group draft uh, will be um, uh, published. And uh, the organization require the authors and uh, the uh, participants in that group uh, or in the public uh, to disclose their IPR. Uh, they have several different uh, choice. Uh, Rand is one uh, kind of them. Uh, free royalty is uh, another one. So you, you should choose that, uh, and then the group will decide, uh, make a decision if we uh, approve the draft or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, as I know, in ONF, even we don't have those kind of um, process or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other difference is that the open source software often is very large site. That, that maybe include a lot of different uh, IPR, something like that. Some we know, some we even don't know. So the problem is that, uh, uh, my question is that, uh, is there some uh, suggestion for the open source uh, um, users or the open source uh, contributor, how we can work uh, some way for us to avoid the, the risk of IPR. Because uh, if we use that, uh, in fact, that a big, big risk. Some IPR we know, some even we don't know. Some uh, even the contributor don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the IPR right. in, included in their contribution, but they don't know. So the, uh, is there some way we can avoid uh, this uh, risk? Thank you. You, <laughs> you smiling. <laughs> um, well, a, a general comment, which is, uh, yes, um, you know, as, as our, our er, earlier speakers said, um, the idea of royalty free is in some ways is mythical because you can't know, not everybody in the world has contributed to the project. So there may be uh, other parties who haven't contributed who own patents. But that's also the case with proprietary software. That's not unique to open source software. Um, with the difference is the proprietary software is, you know, a vendor is going to sell it to you and um, probably in your contract you're going to ask them to indemnify you if you get sued for infringement. But that indemnification claim is also only as good as their, their insurance the to the extent that insurance even covers it and the extent of their assets to back up that indemnification claim. Um, so it, it, it is a risk, but it's not a risk that's unique to open source. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm.